about ways that it, um, it, it intersects with the work that you all are doing, right? And this is a group of people from mostly non-physicians, right? Safety type people and, mm -hmm. and management folks. Is that, is that the, the right uh, yeah, orientation? Yeah, some, some providers, some risk managers, and some patients. I'd, I'd love to have everybody introduce themselves, but I think probably for the sake of time, it makes most sense to just kind of jump in. Is that, is that, what, uh, is that, is that consistent with the way you would like us to do it or me to do it? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Again, uh, as far as disclosures, um, we're not uh, having any financial disclosures. A lot of our work has been funded by CRICO, which hopefully many people are familiar with. It's the Harvard Male Practice Insurer. And then more recently, the Board, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation sort of made a bigger uh, plunge into uh, the area of diagnostic safety. And then HRQ has also been supporting our work, uh, including something that we did related to at the same time, I think Dr. Gallagher, in terms of um, uh, 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 learning from malpractice and preventing um, pre medical malpractice and communicating with patients. So that was called the promises thing. So we'll talk about diagnostic errors just sort of in general terms, their frequency and what we mean by cognitive errors, and then how to really think about diagnosis as a system, really building off this National Academy of Medicine report that uh, uh, was now probably four, four or five years ago, uh, 2015, five years ago. So, uh, so, so this whole idea about how we're going to make diagnosis more accurate and timely and more effectively communicated to the patient is sort of the basis of this report. What, what we would like to do is maybe even add a, a, a fourth bullet here, if we are not to their report, but to, to our aims, which of course is these are the overarching aims for all of us giving good diagnostic care to patients is to deal, de how do we deal with patients whose diagnosis was delayed or, or missed, which uh, is really a very common thing. And uh, as we'll talk about, maybe we're gonna be trying to move forward in cancer with a, perhaps a collaborative with your stream of work and our stream of work, a uh, common thing that you know, patients uh, often, if cancer is missed, it's not one of those things that will go away uh, so somebody has an adverse drug reaction, they feel a little funny and you know, nobody knows why and then they stay there fine. Cancer, you come in, I have a headache and there's nothing wrong with you, it's, it's all in your head in quotes. Um, and then you know, weeks later, somebody has a brain tumor because these things inevitably or often inevitably will get diagnosed later downstream. So um, just to give you the frequency of the errors and medical errors, this is a in Massachusetts, um, where they asked people, have you been involved in error? And 20, a quarter of the patients said, yes, you or, or someone you personally know. So that's not such a big deal. But when this came out, it was, what's the main kind of error? Uh, diagnosis, misdiagnosis, uh, more than treatment or um, wrong medication, et cetera, wrong surgery. And this is at a time there were uh, the initial arc grants, there were 93 initial grants on patient safety that AHRQ um, uh, uh, funded, and only one was dealing with diagnosis. This is this project that we were doing in Chicago, and, and we were the only ones, I think, foolish enough to wade out into the swamp, because it was a swampy area. Um, so again, let me just give you more recent evidence. Uh, tw they asked the National Patient, so patient Safety Foundation and IHI, uh, did a, a, a survey. Have you had experience with a medical error? In this case, they said someone you know or personally. Um, and again, you're looking at almost half, 40% of patients said yes. And again, here we go. Uh, misdiagnosis, uh, mistake during treatment, diagnosis didn't make sense. Diagnosis is the leading type of error. Uh, what, what, are, what are sort of the overall rates of diagnostic errors? Again, we don't have really good hard data on that, but we know that malpractice claims diagnostic error is the most frequent allegation. And they have this approach, which I think would probably be the most rigorous way of defining it, is have standardized patients. So they have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis or COPD known to have that gold standard as a diagnosis, and they have those people knock on the door of, of for example, intranists, and you know, 13% of the patients were, were misdiagnosed. In some, another study, it was more like 20% of other conditions. They sent people with a writer's disease, a standard rheumatology condition, rheumatologists missed this. 
in chart reviews, this is the work, some of the work of Hardeep Singh, about 5% of primary care patients will have a diagnostic error every year in uh, chart reviews. Autopsies, we know that there's these discrepancies even in modern day with the imaging 10 to 20%. Um, and then these are easier to sort of define because we can reread these pathology or radiology reports, a second person reads it or two people. And these rates, two to 5% um, are both small and big when you consider the implications of these. Um, this is a study that we did as part of this um, uh, promises study. We, we collected all the malpractice claims for a five-year period in primary care. And you could see there were roughly 500, 100 a year for five years here. And um, uh, so, th but this is the sort of amazing thing. When you're talking about primary care malpractice diagnosis is really, it's not just the leading one, it's by a factor of you know, six to one. It, it, it dominates over medication and treatment errors, communication errors. Uh, and so this was, uh, this was pooling, by the way, both Crico and Covaris, the two insurers in Massachusetts, they never sort of cooperated, they're sort of competitors, but here we're pooling all the, we're able to pool all their cases. What kind of diagnoses were missed? And this is one of the reasons we're thinking of doing this collaborative project with you all related to cancer. See, cancer, again, is the big, big one, much, almost as much as all the others combined. What cancers, by the way, is my cursor showing up on your screen? Would you be able to uh, tell yeah, me? Yeah, it shows up. Yeah. yeah, so again, you don't need to see my hand shaking here, but colorectal, lung, and prostate, and breast are sort of the big four. And again, I think all of you are sitting on uh, examples of cases where this is um, the uh, um, errors that you're seeing. Uh, the um, uh, more, more amazing finding that we had in this study was this, it takes a moment to explain, but if you look at all the non-general medicine, non-diagnosis cases, it looks like, as you can see, about um, you know 70% of them, 69% are dropped or denied or dismissed. 20% were, were settled. That's where there's some factors where perhaps the defense attorneys look and they say, we, we, we've done something wrong, we can't defend this. Again, 1% go to trial and the plaintiff verdict, people talk about the plaintiffs winning all these cases, but quite the contrary. And then this is a defense verdict. These are the ones that are going to trial. But look over here on the far left, the diagnosis cases as opposed to 20%, 40%, 39, 40% um, were uh, settled. What that means in plain English often is that the lawyers looked and, and the clinicians looked at this chart and they say, oops, we." screwed up. There's something we can't really defend in terms of the care. The, the way I look at this is that there's a lot of preventable um, opportunities for improvement in this, these cases. So this is really was an important finding. Um, I think we won't talk too much about clinical judgment or what, what does this mean, but this is from the Covaris data. They did some further claims analysis. And, and, and a lot of people lump a lot of diagnosis errors into this clinical judgment wastebasket. Um, what, what do they mean? How do they break that down? A narrow diagnostic focus. It turns out in the majority of malpractice cases, there's no differential diagnosis. When you look back and the person came in and the person says, I think this person has pulmonary embolism or they're, having, they're, they're not having a heart attack. There's no differential. They fail to pursue adequate testing. There's tests that are done that are misinterpreted. Um, don't get a specialty referral. So this is some of the things that happen there. These are what we call the cognitive biases. And um, we're um, uh, you know, expanding this list, or you can make this a longer list or a shorter list. Um, this is a, um, a, a, a sort of some major ones. And uh, again, I think clinicians talk a lot about these things. I, I think these are interesting to think about in terms of how they interact with system factors, but something called availability bias. If somebody just saw somebody die of a brain tumor, for example, with a missed headache, maybe they're going to order, you know, head scan, MRIs, or CTs on all their next patients. Or anchoring, you have one piece of information, you get stuck on that, and you don't really look at the whole picture. Confirmation bias, where you're, you know, you have an idea of what this person is, and you order the test, or you kind of do things to confirm that you were right. Uh, we see a certain amount of this with these these cases, these legal cases where people are falsely accused of crimes they didn't commit, that how this gets stuck on one thing and you 
seek all, all the evidence that supports your bias or misdiagnosis. Hindsight bias, I wanna just mention that here because many of these diagnosis errors sort of look in retrospect obvious. How could the person have not known this was cancer or this was a heart attack? You know, this looks like a classic presentation for sepsis, but um, it's sort of easy to, know, to do that retrospectively, but you don't wanna really, uh, you have to put yourself in the upstream uh, mode of all the patients that I see with headaches or back pain or, or fever, for example. So um, again, this is our larger taxonomy. This is a figure that I think um, I, I would like to promote a little bit less complicated than the one in the National Academy of Medicine report, where um, maybe I'm just, just too simple-minded to, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, boil it down to anything more complex than this. But if you think about it, you have diagnostic process failures and you have missed, delayed, and misdiagnosis and adverse outcome. I, I guess a missed diagnosis would just be somebody who never had the diagnosis made, maybe it was found on autopsy, but basically delayed and misdiagnosis. And these diagnostic process failures are happening all the time in your organization. Somebody's um, sodium is mixed up between patient A and patient B, or um, you, uh, uh, you know, I fail to follow up a test result and, or, or I, I, I don't take a good history on a patient, I'm rushed, or I'm seeing them remotely and I'm not doing a good exam or no exam. Um, you know, but often that does not result in a missed or delayed or misdiagnosis or an adverse outcome. But it turns out there's about 80,000 patients in this little intersection here in the hospitals at least of diagnostic errors that people have said are, are errors that are happening probably conservatively from diagnostic failure. So, um, you know, so you can have, for example, I talked about it mixing up a specimen, you know, with the sodium, but, you know, there's Linda McDougall. I, I don't know if anyone remembers that name, but she, she had a bilateral mastectomy um, and they woke up from her surgery and they said, you don't have cancer. And she said, I'm so glad, doctor, you were able to, you know, cut it out all off. And they said, no, actually, you never had cancer. We mixed up your pathology specimen with another patient. And so, you know, this is obviously a process failure that relates that that there, that there was related to a, a causing a missed that missed diagnosis and an adverse outcome in her case. So it's really those are the areas where we want to really think about how we can improve some of these diagnostic processes. So these are the goals of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, uh, and again, help me. We we, we have about um, an hour or so we'll spend about 35, 40 minutes with me presenting. Is, is that again okay in terms of your format or people have yes, less? That's, that's perfect, thank you. Perfect. So, um, you know, these are the eight goals of the NAM. Again, many of you are probably familiar with this, but just to remind you, one is promoting more effective teamwork, um, especially with patients and their family. So it's this idea that the doctors, diagnosis is a doctor's job and patients are consumers and the patient, the, the doctors and the Clinicians are, are the producers of diagnosis. It's just a really misguided. This also talks about including pathologists and radiologists, other people as part of the team, but mainly I think this is key. We'll talk about this some more. Um, enhanced professional education. That's sort of what we're doing here to increase awareness of these biases and perhaps ways of overcoming it. Make sure that health information technologies help support patients. This is a very big topic, one of great interest to me. I'd love to many of the questions often come up, we'll talk about this, but uh, you know, I, I would say right now, the HIT systems are probably uh, distracting us and harming us as much as they helping us or certainly not living up to the potential. And we'll talk about that some more. Learning from errors so we can uh, bring them forward and share them. We have this project called PRIDE where we're, we brought together the, the IHI and NPSF, which is now merged into that, um, and Massachusetts Coalition on Medical Errors and a number of the institutions in Boston and the two, three male practice insurers where we're sharing cases and uh, try, try to do that in a safe way, protected with um, various state statutes that we have to be able to have these conversations for these anonymized cases. Establish a work system and culture, and we're gonna talk about that in more depth in a second a reporting environment and medical legal liability that facilitates learning 
you know, the worst thing about all those malpractice cases, at least historically, is that, you know, they're, they're signed and sealed and settled and there's even agreements not to talk about them with anybody, but what, what, what a tragedy that people are having these errors without other people learning from them. Redesigning the payment system, I guess at the very least this means um, supporting enough time when you, when you see patients. If I see eight patients an hour, you, you know I'm gonna be making diagnostic errors. And then funding for research, of course, uh, that's near and dear to our heart. And frankly, a very tiny amount of research currently goes to this uh, type of uh, work. So I, I wanted to boil these down in terms of the things that I would emphasize most to you is um, these five practical suggestions, okay? One is we're creating a culture of diagnostic safety. Again, we're gonna go into each of these in depth. Again, learning from and anticipating errors. I mentioned this pride network. Ensuring closed loop systems and we have a very large ARC grant with working with system engineers. We're gonna talk about that to, re to do that. Um, frankly, this is a, a big thing that I think we're only gonna just scratch the surface. Uh, leveraging health IT, as we mentioned, especially in terms of clinical documentation, and then engaging the patients more thoroughly and fully to co-produce better diagnosis. So let's just uh, take a moment and talk about uh, diagnostic uh, safety culture. Um, and to me, this was actually written in the response to some colleagues actually who I respect a lot, Andrew Olson and Mark Graber, saying we need metrics to improve diagnosis. And uh, I started thinking about that and the metrics that they proposed. And I sort of, this is sort of my rebuttal. <coughs> um, we really, more than metrics, we, we just need an improved culture. So. Number one, driving out fear. So no one's afraid to ask questions or question a diagnosis or share when things go wrong. So, you know, patients should feel free to say, doctor, that, that doesn't make sense. I, you know, you said that my, my hair loss was caused by that drug. I, I started losing my hair before I started that drug. Or, or um, are, are you sure, it, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, from what I've read, that doesn't sound like it, or it's, you're, you're giving me the medicine for this urinary infection, but it's not getting better. Are you sure that's, that's what's wrong with me? Or, um, so, um, so, so we really need to create a sort of a, a different climate and culture, and, uh, and frankly, a sort of a, a, a sort of an empowerment for patients and a modesty on the part of clinicians, doctors, to, and, and a non-defensiveness. So, and, and then when things do go wrong, learning from these, of these things. So next, we have to have organizations commit to this. So how many of your leaders know that diagnosis errors are the number one type of medical error, and what are they doing about it? So, um, uh, you know, there was recently, a couple of, about a year ago, there was a survey about organizational readiness and activities that are going on to uh, address diagnostic error. Many organizations were recognizing the problem, but almost none were doing anything about it in terms of any formal, <coughs> work. Uh, so what does this, again, involve more aggressive reporting, following up, investigation of adverse events, um, a curiosity, wondering what, 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 what's, what's wrong with the patient, what could we be missing, what can go wrong in the system. I think people know about these high reliability organizations where people worry about things that can go wrong all the time. We should be thinking about these in our organization in terms of tests not being followed up or patients uh, not being reached or, or just symptoms not being, loops being closed. So uh, what I put here is obsession with the details of diagnostic process and its limitations, especially the limitations of tests. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that, but uh, I think one of the, the most uh, worrisome limited tests today in 2020, September, is the COVID test, the false negative problem with COVID testing. So now, now, not only do we have patients who are asymptomatic that are spreading this, but we have people in, in some instances, 70% uh, sensitivity, 30% false negative to COVID testing. So thinking about what that means. Uh, number three, and, and here's, here's where this uncertainty that I, I, I'm alluding to in this one important test, but it's inherent in diagnostic tests, in illness presentation, and evolution, we need to anticipate common pitfalls. So we need to know that <coughs> that test is not 100% sensitive. Um, 
we need to know what those those numbers are from the literature. What are some of the things that go wrong? Um, we need proactive safety nets to to deal with this problem that we um, uh, uh, can't always be certain what's going on with a patient. And we need conservative approaches to testing and imaging. This it almost sounds like this would be contradicting one and two, but uh, you could say, well, let's order a total body scan. Let's order three different COVID tests. Let's order uh, serology tests. But we, we want to actually try to figure out how to be conservative in doing this. And uh, I think reliable follow-up, shared decision-making are part of this. It's cool. Respect for human limitations. Uh, so there needs to be uh, decreased reliance on human memory and um, uh, helping people find things in the medical record. Uh, so they have to be redesigned to support cognition. I don't know if I put some slides in about that, but we'll certainly talk about it. And then finally, enhanced role for the patient. Uh, so again, we need to work collaboratively to get a good history on the patient and monitor people's courses, raise questions. Uh, again, this is, uh, has to be sort of hardwired into both the processes and the culture. And uh, um, again, the first step is sort of a modesty of uh, on the part of the clinicians and, and realizing that uh, um, they could be missing things or we could, and we, we wanna be open to that and not defensive about that. So number two is learning from uh, and, and sharing errors and diagnostic pitfalls. So, um, you know, we talk about this term situational awareness um, in, in perhaps applied to diagnosis. So, you know, this is sort of a specialized kind of situational awareness. So. You know, in high reliability organization theory, you know, pe nuclear submarines, people are, are worrying constantly about what can go wrong. I don't know if people remember and saw or saw the movie of Sullenberger, the pilot who crashed the plane or landed the plane in the Hudson River. That, that morning he had rehearsed a water landing of what to do if that plane landed. There had never been a water landing of a commercial domestic air flight uh, prior to that, but yet they had rehearsed many of the steps of what to do. And as people remember, he was able to get everybody out safely. It's the thing sunk within just a couple of minutes with nobody going down with the plane. So, you know, and he was a safety expert in, again, a, a theory, a, a expert in organizational theory, appreciation of uncertainty. Here we go again. I keep uh, emphasizing this, but it's important. And then a related part is knowing when you're over your head. So it's one thing if, if I don't, if I'm not an expert about how to treat shoulder pain or, or unusual infections, uh, but I, I just need to know what I know and what I don't know and how to call in help and make it easier. Um, um, I, I think many people here, or some people may have heard Don Berwick's story about his first night on internship, um, where he, he was told he was at uh, I believe Mass General Hospital, or he was one of the Harvard hospitals. He ultimately was a pediatrician trained. They said, uh, you know, I'm the resident. I'm going to go to sleep. You're the intern. Uh, you know, if, if you have any problem, if there's anything you don't know or anything you're uncomfortable with, uh, go ahead and call me. Um, but no one ever has called the resident on this shift. So I just want to let you know. So, you know, giving a message that we have to make a uh, so, you know, you can, you can tell how likely he was going to be to call, wake up the resident and call for help. We, we need to kind of have the opposite going on here in our organizations, making failures visible, uh, this idea about don't miss diagnosis and red flags and diagnostic pitfalls. We've been working with Harrison's textbook of medicine. We're hoping in future editions that every chapter would have, these are the diagnostic pitfalls to avoid. And um, again, this is... Uh, I'll just skip that here. Uh, we have this thing, for example, of don't miss diagnoses, right? So it's one thing if I, I miss a diagnosis that really doesn't make a difference and it's not critical or, or life-threatening, but I, I call them the four R's, something that's rare, right? So if somebody comes with chest pain, I'm gonna think about a heart attack um, uh, or a high fever and you know COVID exposure, but but these are things that are less commonly thought of, rapidly progressive. So it's not like, well, let's give you some aspirin and see how you do in a couple of days. Remediable, so there's something we can do about these and really bad. So these are the four R's and these are three clinical examples. So somebody with spinal cord compression, 
I, I suspect every one of you in your organization has somebody who's come in with uh, um, back pain and uh, or pre previously had back pain and then next thing you know within a matter of hours to days is paralyzed from uh, uh, you know a metastatic uh, lesion to the, the, to the back to the spinal cord or upper airway obstruction pericardial tamponade for the non-clinicians you know that's fluid gets around the sac of the heart it's it's basically a kind of heart failure but it's one that's requires you to put a needle in there to drain that out urgently otherwise it's uh, it can be fatal uh, and then the, the other thing I talk about is the four C's continuing exposures you know you don't want to send somebody home who has COVID or TB or, or back to their carbon monoxide emitting space heater contagious chronically progressive or confusing so even like occupational asthma sending somebody back repeatedly to uh, an environment that they're you know exposed to cotton dust or something that they're causing progressive lung damage. Um, and so we, we put together this list of don't miss diagnoses. I don't expect anybody to uh, memorize this from this list. It's just the concept here, things such as aortic dissection and spinal epidural abscesses, one I just mentioned where it could either be a tumor or infection pressing on the spinal cord. This is another one of those infections. I'm, sure every one of you has seen this in your organization. If you look back to 10 years, that's been delayed. It's a very uh, aggressive uh, soft tissue infection that destroys lots of tissue very quickly. It's like a, like a California wildfire in a way. If anaerobes are feeling the anaerobes. It's like a sort of a fire of, of uh, infectious um, destruction of tissue that has to be diagnosed and excised. And meningitis. Here you have things like celiac sprue that's very treatable that people can have all sorts of nutritional deficiencies or food poisoning um, or withdrawal somebody is you know having seizures from barbiturate withdrawal or benzodiazepine withdrawal etc ectopic pregnancy torsion of the testes we we're, we've seen we've been reviewing cases of these uh, particular ones so this is a list of and it's, you know, it's both in some ways an overwhelming list on one hand, but on the other hand, it's a sort of a finite list. It's, you know, just a couple of dozen of these that uh, your clinicians probably will need be ways of considering these. And I had added COVID infection as one of those. Um, so what is a diagnostic pitfall? It's a clinical situation where there's patterns or vulnerabilities leading to misdiagnosis. So here's my uh, um, one classic example of a diagnostic pitfall. A woman comes in with a breast lump and the doctor examines that and confirms the presence of a breast lump and um, he or she refers the patient to a mammogram, comes back negative. And so the doctor says to the woman, you don't have to worry, your mammogram's normal. And of course we know that that's not sufficient. You know, we have negative mammograms with screening, but here is a breast lump. And so that's a diagnostic pitfall that we now know, in fact, there's things hardwired in most radiology um, reporting. If you, if you order a diagnostic mammogram for a breast lump, then a negative mammogram does not, uh, it's not where you stop. You need to go on to do ultrasound and biopsy aspiration. So this is a diagnostic pitfall. These, and there's many cases where this, these things are recurring. And in fact, um, what's happened here? I click something I shouldn't click. Let's see, canvas print. I have no idea what's going on here. That's, <laughs> must have been something that's on the corner of my screen. We'll quickly get back here. Oh, good, okay. So you have um, disease A repeatedly mistaken for disease B. So bipolar mistaken for depression or um, uh, aortic aneurysm mistaken for uh, MI. Failure to appreciate test limitations. There's the example we just mentioned. Atypical presentation. So somebody presents with uh, cognitive difficulties and it's Addison's disease. Um, or another one would be sepsis in an elderly patient with no fever, okay? Or uh, um, presuming a chronic disease accounts for the new symptoms. So somebody who has a uh, lung cancer and they're short of breath, but you just say it's their underlying COPD or, or another one is rheumatoid arthritis. You have a swollen knee and you don't realize the person has gotten an infection of their knee 
overlooking drug and environmental causes. We see a lot of that. Um, just, and then failure to monitor evolving symptoms. So somebody comes in and uh, they have a head injury and they're fine, but uh, they need to be followed up after that because things can deteriorate or some neural can be developing. And so the way that I put this together, I, I don't know, we're hoping to get your heads around this because we, we need want, want to really operationalize this clinically. You have on one hand, these don't miss diagnoses. Um, you have red flags that are sort of warning things that somebody has back pain. If you have fever or, or a history of cancer, these are sort of red flags when somebody has cancer or somebody has heartburn, but then they're, they have weight loss or blood in their stool or throwing up and then the diagnostic pitfalls and sort of how to make these three constructs work together to leverage to really create these awareness as well as safety nets of these things that go wrong. Closed loop systems. This is a the water goes on the same time every day whether it's raining or the water is flooded. So what we really need is closed loop systems where you get feedback where you know the temperature gets too hot it turns off the heat or thermostat. Um, the water, if the water's, if the lawn's drenched, there's no reason the water should be going on or it's raining. We've done some uh, work around this where we've tried to create automated feedback loops. So we work with the University of Alabama, Ida Berner and her group, and it turns out that when we used IVR calls, these automated calling, 16% of the patients had not improved and only 21 of those had contacted the clinician. So patients are sitting there, they're not getting better and um, in many cases, it's we have the wrong diagnosis. And uh, um, without these sort of proactive follow-up systems, we're not getting the closed loop. So we think feedback's really important. It has a key role in safety on multiple levels. It's first of all, it's saying that the patient has a role to play. We're sending you home, but you know you're not done as a co-producer co of, of the diagnosis. We we need you to monitor how you're doing. Conveys our uncertainty. Um, and making access if needed. I, I give people my cell phone number. People seem to think that's amazing, but it's, it's, it's a peace of mind for me to let the patient know they can get through if all else fails directly. Uh, test of time, it allows you to have a differential diagnosis. We have feedback. Diseases can change, um, makes invisible. Health IT, I'm rushing a little bit here, looking at the time. We actually wrote this as a rebuttal to an earlier or previous paper that, that, that Jerome Groupman wrote. He's sort of a popular uh, physician at Beth Israel where he wrote a book about the clinicians and errors. And he was very concerned about electronic medical records making things worse, as are we. But and most people sort of treat clinical documentation as sort of the, the paperwork you have to do to clean up after the job is done. So I saw uh, 12 patients this morning and now I have all these notes sitting there I have to do, but um, we would like CYA to stand for Canvas for Your Assessment, where it's an opportunity for me to sit back and think about what's really going on with these patients. What do I mean by that? Weighing the differential diagnosis and how likely they are and how urgent they are and conveying that in my notes to the greatest extent possible and the next person. So we've tried to create a sort of a hierarchy of how or taxonomy of how we can use health information to reduce diagnostic errors. Again, this is a very uh, quick overview of that, but there's tools that can assist in information gathering that can make sure we collect all this patient's occupational exposure or travel history and doesn't get lost. Facilitating cognition by displaying information flow sheets so their patient's labs or maybe even with their medications uh, in the same access tools for de generating a differential diagnosis. So maybe uh, we've seen examples of things like Isabel can be integrated into EMRs. As I'm typing my note, we can see the, diff the, the different diagnoses so I can consider them. Calculators to do what we call weighing it properly, Bayes theorem, picking the right test. So I wanna rule out hemochromatosis. So what's the right test to do that? I can never remember. Um, reference material and guidelines. What, what's, what's the workup for hematuria? I need to have that at my fingertips. Um, tools to facilitate reliable follow-up, just as we were talking about, so we can close the loop. Supporting early screening, so we, we know that uh, people get the screening test they need, or if somebody's had an adenoma on their colonoscopy, I just saw somebody who didn't have a follow-up on that uh, in three years like they should have. 
tools to support diagnostic collaboration. So I can push a button and I say, what, what is this rash? I, 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 this is not, I'm not familiar with it. What, what do you think this is? What should I do? Um, you know, we, we need to figure out how to do that to safely and reimbursement wise. And then systems that make us learn from where we went wrong. So the final one, so we're really gonna wrap up here and go to the Q&A is just, how are we gonna work with the patients to produce better, co-produce better diagnosis? And uh, um, I don't know, there's a lot of elements to this. I mean, everybody says, well, it was the patient's fault they didn't come in early versus the doctor's fault. We couldn't get access to your a, a timely appointment. And the whole idea is not this tug of war of who's blaming who. So we don't say that this is the responsibility for the patients in co-producing the diagnosis. This is their role helping get in in a timely way. Obviously, I don't know if somebody's not having a problem. They need to be reliable. If I want to say, I want to check back in with you with 72 hours, I need to, they need to be answering the phone or coming back to the clinic so I can see how their, their rash or their swollen joint is doing. They need to be a keen observer. I say, you know, is it, are your urinary symptoms getting any better or worse? Um, they, they need to be able to accurately tell me what's, what's going on there, you know. Um, proactive on test results. I think what I mean by that, or what we mean is that, you know, if somebody hasn't heard, even if the, you know, people should be informing normals and abnormals, they should be, patients should be, you know, saying, I have not heard back. You, you never told me what that thyroid test showed or what the, uh, the, the anemia results showed uh, or looking it up themselves in, in, um, in patient portals. Sharing their hunches is another one that doctors hate. Patients come in with stacks of paper from the internet. I think I have lupus. I think I have, um, you know, uh, uh, celiac disease. And uh, personally, let's, let's, let's hear what's on patients' minds. Often I say, gee, that's, that's not a bad idea. I never, never thought about that. Let's try this curiously reading on their own. Again, these are trying to ch change sort of the, the paradigm here, meticulously adhering with empiric regimens. Let's try you on um, a treatment for your urinary infection symptoms. And you know, if the patient doesn't take the medicine, I can't tell if I have the wrong diagnosis or if, if they're just, it's just non-adherence, active as co-investigators, uh, being willing to grapple with uncertainty. So we're finishing up a project where we're trying to think, how do we communicate uncertainty to patients? This is a really tough one. You know, patients want to be reassured. They want to be told definitively there's nothing wrong with you or there is what is wrong with me. And often, honestly, we can't do that. Being patient with time and tests, uh, recruiting family. So sometimes, uh, you know, I, I want your daughter to just tell me if you, um, if, if you're continuing, this is the one I just saw today. If, are you continuing to get lost in the supermarket? I, I just need to find out what's, how your, your memory loss is doing and progressing it respecting limits on staff time and society resources. And we, we're sort of all in this together. Agreeing to disagree, I, I, I have a patient who is sure she has lupus. She thinks I'm a very bad doctor for not treating her for lupus. I, 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 we just, you know, we sent her to a specialist. They don't think she has lupus, but we're just, we're just gonna honestly agree to disagree. Um, help building communication and trust. I think continuity is important there. And even this final one, getting involved with patient organizations. So we have the Society for Improving Diagnosis in Medicine. Every October, if for the last 11 years, we've brought together, now it's up to 500 people, including about a third of them are patients who've had experiences with misdiagnosis and really wonderful putting together of clinicians and, and cognitive psychology people. Uh, we're we're going to have this conference virtually this year, but... Uh, I don't know how that will be quite the same, but this is an important place. So the key question, last slide, what will it take at the provider level and the institutional level to support these things and have these flourish? You know, Again, if somebody wants to uh, tell me for 20 minutes or half hour, all their hunches of everything they've read on the internet and I only have 10 minutes to see them and I'm spending five minutes of that trying to get connected with the uh, Zoom call, then forget it. I mean, that's, that, those, that culture is not going to flourish. But if I do have enough time, if I know my patients well enough, um, that's going to be a, a, a better way to make a, a better diagnosis and prevent errors and delay and communicate with patients in a way that we're on the same side. So, so again, we conclude with these three questions. I forgot I had this. You know, what else might this be? What doesn't fit? Making sure that any abnormal findings are 
not overlooked? And then what critical diagnoses should we be missing, you know, from that list that I show you? So, and then we have these three systems. Do we have a reliable closed loop system for tracking symptoms and abnormal labs and important referrals? What's the culture and climate in our organization? And how can we get the EMR to be something out of, out of the way of causing problems in terms of frustrating doctors and bearing information, how to leverage it to make improvement. So that's truly it. So again, these are the takeaway points. Let's open this up for questions. You can take a look at these. I won't read through these because we've um, just covered that. So do you want, do you want to open it up? How, how will we do this? Can people unmute or is there? Yes. Is there um, yeah, so uh, we, can, we can take questions in the chat box. Um, and participants can also unmute themselves uh, or raise their hand and I can unmute them yeah. uh, to ask a question. We did get one question already in the chat box from Trish Anderson who um, said the changing of an organizational culture has been suggested to be a five to 15 year process. Would you comment on that as a first step as proposed? Um, well, uh, I, I fully agree. It's not something like me giving a lecture and then the culture organization changes tomorrow or Tom puts out a bunch of guidelines. Um, it, it is a longer term. One would hope it would be a cumulative process though. Um, sometimes it feels like change in organizations is like um, a treadmill where you know you have people coming and going and there's discontinuities and different leaders and it's no longer a priority. So I, I wouldn't mind if it was a long-term process, if it was progressively building that people over time were learning, people were, uh, you know, positively reinforcing when you raise a question rather than getting uh, somebody telling you, you, you know, what do you know, or it's none of your business, and that people are learning and getting feedback. So um, I, I think I would like to think about how organizations can, can do it as a long-term project over time, how it could become something self-reinforcing and uh, fueling uh, each, each part of it, synergizing and fueling another part. So um, again, that, that's, I, I think the continuity thing is important. I, you know, Deming talks about constancy of purpose um, and his sense that it's getting lost. He was dealing with corporate America, but I, I worry that, you know, you see so much turnover in practices. We work with uh, um, 30 practices in the Promises Project. One of the intervention project uh, uh, practices had 150% turnover in the 18 months that we were working with them. Wow. In other words, people had turned over and then they, that person had turned over again of the key clinicians we were working with. So I, I, I don't know if that would take five years or 15 years or an infinite amount of years to to improve culture in that, in that uh, setting. Um, Tom Gallagher has a question. Gordy, uh, Tom Gallagher, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. As, as you know, you and I both are very interested in the interface between communication and resolution programs and diagnostic error. And we, we hope our work together will reduce diagnostic errors um, but when they happen, can you share a little bit of advice about how you think we should communicate with patients? Patients are so sort of, um, uh, it's so hard to communicate with patients when they're, they're worried that there's been a delay or a misdiagnosis and they're not sure, does, did this really matter to me? Was it an error? Who is responsible? Did I play a role in this as the patient? What, what sorts of words of wisdom do you have about communicating with a patient who, who worries about a diagnostic error or when an actual diagnostic error has occurred? Yeah, um, well, in preface to this, let me say that an error has occurred in my uh, scheduling and awareness of this program today. So I owe you a full apology and disclosure. Uh, I think we've picked up the ball and ran forward and maybe that could be a metaphor here. Um, you know, I, I saw this on my schedule. I didn't know what was it CAI stood for? I forgotten that we were, were committed to this. So uh, I, 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 I bow down to you folks for, for being tolerant of my, uh, fault tolerant of my uh, ball, dropping the ball. And, and I think that's sort of the first uh, metaphor in a sense of, 
I think we have to have sort of relationships with our patients. That's, is, each day that we're building relationships, in some ways we're laying the groundwork for having that conversation that's, I wouldn't say inevitable, in every case there's gonna be a horrible diagnosis that we miss, but it is inevitable in, in some cases. So, so one is we have to have the, the basis of trust and um, communication that exists and, uh, and, and think about the conditions that, that really are important to that. I mean, in primary care for me, especially it's continuity and knowing my patients, having enough time, making them feel heard and respected. Um, I think you're asking a little bit in the moment, then how, how are we going to be um, leveraging some of our respective uh, lessons and experiences? Um, I, I, th I think the first one to me is, is sort of an honesty and a transparency, okay? Um, and a willingness to admit uh, in a sort of a non-defensive way that we could have made a mistake. I, I think another one is actually honesty about often we can't tell, you know, would, would, here is this x-ray, here, here's a nodule, I, I'm, I'm looking at it retrospectively, and it looks like we might have missed your lung cancer, Mrs. Smith. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, we show this to three radiologists or 10, and they, they had a hard time seeing it too. And I, I wanna be able to talk about patients in a way that they don't think I'm just being defensive or covering myself, but, um, but, but just really in an honest way, where, and again, uh, trying to, uh, again, make these conversations as sort of uh, uh, financially neutral, that I, I'm not doing this to sort of make money or selling people on things or defend myself uh, financially. So, so that's another part of it. I think another part is sort of a willingness to sort of bring in other people. Let's see what our neurologist would have said. What, 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 what should have been done with, uh, when you presented with that kind of shoulder weakness? I just missed a patient with... Um, with what's called myasthenia gravis, if people know this diagnosis, it's a pretty treatable and serious neurologic condition. And let's let's bring in the neurologist. Let, let's let let let's look at the chart together and see where are the opportunities. Where should I have picked this up sooner? And you know, and and and, and then I, I think another one does have to do with this sort of guilt thing, Tom. Uh, you know, people have cancer. People, you know, the person is feeling guilty that they didn't stop smoking. Their wife had told them to stop and that they should have come in sooner. And so, you know, we just have to try to um, sort of clear the air of, of these things. They're not, that doesn't, those things don't go away, but the extent to which we can sort of have those things out on the table and, and be able to sort of honestly talk about them. I guess another one would be to try to do this over time. So, so let's say today, I just found out you have lung cancer and, um, and I missed the module on your chest x-ray. Uh, I, I guess some of the conversation about what happened and reviewing that and putting in prevention so it doesn't happen again is probably best not having that conversation on day one. The person just dealing with the fact that they're not gonna see their daughter's graduation, you know, because it's got stage three lung cancer or something. So I, I think some of this is, is thinking about these longitudinally as, as sort of a process rather than a single event. Again, I assume many of these overlap with things I've already learned from you implicitly. I'm implicitly incorporating them rather than independently bringing in some of our own work. I just want to tell you about one case when we talked about a missed nodule. I, I have a patient, she's one of my favorite patients, and um, uh, she, uh, um, I, give, I give away a music CD every year to my patients and she comes in dressed to the hilt. So I, I assume she goes to the opera and would have nothing to do with folk music, but it turns out she used to play in Greenwich Village with, with Mary of Peter, Paul and Mary, anybody who knows him. So, so, I was, so we bonded around that. And anyway, next thing, fast forward five years, I, I missed a nodule on her chest X-ray and her daughter is a, is a leading plaintiff's attorney in Boston. So here I am talking about, you know, follow-up of abnormal results, and I've written a book on that subject and all this, and, and here I am naked, really, in terms of this error that occurred in her case. And uh, so we called her in with, she, she wanted her other daughter to come in, and we discussed it, and, and in her case, we ended up having an M&M that she was actually a part of. And, you know, her, she, her attitude was, this lung cancer will have to take its place behind my other problems. Um, she was an older woman and uh, she did die of the lung cancer. Um, 
And uh, she brought in a list of a dozen other things that we had done wrong in terms of delaying starting chemotherapy and things that had gone wrong. And um, she felt very empowered and very, very listened to. So I think those are some things that can be in, in the end, instead of a male practice suit, we got in her death notice that she, people should make donations to our patient safety center. So, um, you know, not every patient, well, she, her ending wasn't that, but I guess the, the, um, the, the other thing is that the surgeon told me that uh, even if I, we had diagnosed it with the first x-ray, that it probably wouldn't have changed the outcome. So we need to be able to tell people that in a way that, um, again, is not uh, us defending or covering ourselves, but we're trying to share honestly what's going on. And of course, patients need to be able to trust us when we say something like that. But, and maybe that makes them also feel less guilty and bad. I don't know, a few quick thoughts. They're, they're probably not as wise as the kinds of ways you talk about these things, Tom, but um, anyway, any, let's do any other feedback or reactions, perhaps get another question or two in. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Did anybody else wanna um, ask Dr. Schiff anything? Great, well. I I, you know, just uh, maybe some uh, other uh, reaction, Tom, to what I'm saying to you here or in the talk, or, or maybe I can build a little bit on what we're trying to think about doing um, in this potential collaboration. Might well, you know, as, as you know, yeah. as you, as you know, Gordy, you know, there are all sorts of potential intersections between the improving diagnosis space and the communication and resolution program space, but the ones that really stand out the most strongly are, you know, the transparency. And you talked eloquently about culture and how important transparency is to that culture. And that transparency is not just doctors and patients, but doctors and nurses with one another and with the organization and across organizations. So transparency, patient and family engagement is a central part of both bodies of work and then learning. Um, so we hope to work together and really try to understand how we improve diagnosis of cancer through a focus on really operationalizing transparency to a greater extent, patient and family engagement and, and, and learning. And I, I'm really excited about the work. You know, for the risk managers on the phone, you may be wondering where is the financial and non-financial resolution and that is uh, an important part of CRP, uh, but for those of you who handle uh, delayed diagnosis of, of cancer or other delayed diagnosis liability cases, it's really complex from a legal perspective to try to understand was there an error, did that error harm the patient, and what sort of damages were associated. So uh, Gordy and, uh, uh, and others and I have been working on trying to bring those three threads together to, to sort of um, advance the work of both fields. Yeah, I, I guess I'd even add one more thing that um, it's amazing the patient's eyes, what they understand about the processes that are uh, opportunities for improvement. You know, they've been through these journeys of getting a diagnosis, for example, of cancer and known all the, the detours, the ups, the downs, the, the places that that were successful and that were not listening to them and missteps. And uh, I, I think we really want to uh, learn a lot more about that. I, I think we're not sufficiently well-informed about this journey to getting a diagnosis of cancer. Um, you, know, you know, you put on top of that a bunch of controversies about we're just reviewing what cervical cancer screening, you know, how should we be doing it? How often should we be doing it? Who should be doing this? Which patients? Um, you know, so it's, it's really quite confusing. And um, we, we just need to be able to communicate with patients these uncertainties uh, in, in a way that, uh, um, uh, you know, is, is a process over time. Uh, again, this transparency thing that one more thing, you know, I don't know how many people know where we're coming from I mean, in the nursing literature not too long ago it's nurses are forbidden from making diagnosis you know there's something called a nursing diagnosis but you know it would be um 
uppity for a nurse to set up, step up as doctor, I think the person's heart failure is decompensating. That's, um, that, that's not the nurse's job. Well, of, of course, I, I, that nurse is at that patient's bedside um, or the person is not responding to your treatment of heart failure. You think they may have pulmonary embolism. So we, we need to empower people through, throughout the healthcare system. I was just on a call with um, uh, a doctor from Yale, a pathologist, who really is very keen on having pathology reports directly from the pathologist to the patient as, for critical ones that are significantly abnormal to make sure, A, that nothing falls through the crack and B, that they understand what those results are. So this, this idea about diagnosis being a team effort and, and weaving systems, hardwiring systems around that is I think a, a very sort of exciting challenge. And I think the CRP thing has a big, big role in, in, in weaving those threads together.